So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, communication and signal processing seminar. And so before we get started, before I introduce the speaker today, I wanted to just uh, thank the research areas for NCIS and SP for supporting the seminar series. And also Kate uh, Goodwin, who's been the, who's handling everything behind and she's the one who makes things work. <clears throat> so I'm delighted today to, um, to introduce our speaker, Salman Avashtimi. So um, not to give, put too much pressure on him, but he's an excellent speaker. So in addition to the doing great work, he always gives fantastic talks. Um, so, so with that as a preface, let me introduce him. So Salman is currently a Dean's Professor, the inaugural Director of the USC Amazon Center on Secure and Trusted Machine Learning, and the Director of the Information Theory and Machine Learning Research Lab at the ECE Department of the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. He's also an Amazon scholar at Alexa. So he received his PhD in 2008 and an MS degree in 2005, both in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at the University of California, Berkeley. And as it's very typical of that particular group, he decided he was going to spend a few years in Cornell and then move back. Though he did change the thing a little bit, he moved to USC as moving back to Berkeley. Yeah. His research interests include information theory and large scale distributed computing and machine learning, secure and private computing learning, and federal good luck, which he's going to talk about today. So, Dr. Avishtamir uh, has received many, a number of awards for his research, including recently the James L. Massey Research and Teaching Award from the Information Theory Society. Information Theory Society and Communication Society Joint Paper Award, a PCAS Award from the White House, um, a Young Investigator Program Award from uh, the Air Force, the National Science Foundation Career Award, the David uh, J. Uh, Sakrison Memorial Prize for his thesis, and several Best Paper Awards at conferences. He's been an associate editor uh, for the IEEE Transactions and Information Theory and was recently the general co-chair of the 2020 ISIT uh, Information Theory work, uh, Conference. He's also a fellow of the IEEE, and with that, I give the um, floor to Salman. Salman, go ahead. Sure. Uh, thanks much, Vijay, for the generous introduction and nice introduction. And thanks for inviting me here. It's great to see you all virtually. And hopefully, you know, you will interrupt me during the talk to make it interactive. Otherwise, I'm getting bored. <laughs> All right. So the more you interrupt me, the better. Yeah. So we do ask. I mean, I let people ask questions. If there's anything on chat, I will. Uh, also exactly, because I can't see the chat. So if you relay it, that's going to be great. All right. So let me uh, share my screen. You can see my slides now, right? So, uh, yes. Yeah. Perfect. So, you know, for, for today, as uh, Vijay, you mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, federated learning. This is a big area. So I thought I focus on the privacy leakage in federated learning. This is some of the, uh, you know, interesting results that we have. And uh, I thought to mention that this is in collaboration with several students, former postdocs and colleagues who are listed here. All right, very good. So let me start by motivating the setting and the problem, which I think is very well motivated and is motivated by having millions of AI powered smart devices around us. And typically the way such ecosystem is work, there is a lot of data collected at the edge of the network. For example, these are the interactions between the users and, you know, smart devices like Alexa device, Google device, Apple device, etc. And at the end of the day, to enable a good machine learning algorithm, you have to train models over these data that is generated at the edge. And once you look at that, you realize that data is very sensitive. It's like my images, my video, my voice, or your children images, yourself, etc. So that's why there has been a lot of excitement how to do 
learning distributedly across such a massive scale while ensuring privacy, security, and trust in the system. Okay, so privacy would mean you want to make sure the local data sets, the low, you know, personal images are kept private. Security would mean others can't influence the system, and trust is much more broader. And there are a lot of works on that. Okay, so that's a very important problem, and fidelity learning has emerged as a promising approach for this problem. At a high level, the principle of fidelity learning is very simple. It says train locally and aggregate or average globally. What it would mean is the training is gonna be done locally at each device by keeping, you know, by using the data on that device. And then once everybody comes up with a local trained model, you try to aggregate them together. A simple aggregation, like for example, in federated learning is federated averaging. That's like the starting point, but there could be more complex aggregations. So this way you combine the knowledge or the model from different users to come up with a better, more representative model and then pushing it back to the users, maybe for the next round of training or you know, for their use. Okay, so this is like one of those things that the concept is very simple, train locally, average globally. But once you start digging into it, it's, uh, you know, becomes a very exciting research area from, uh, you know, various perspectives. For example, there are a lot of problems from the algorithm design. The, you know, some of the challenges that arise in federated learning is this issue of model aggregation when to aggregate, how frequent do you need to aggregate? What would you aggregate? Should it be locally model, train model? Should be a compressed version of that? How do you aggregate it? These are you know, fundamental problems not solved. Compared with distributed learning, there are many different angles of the problem. For example, as opposed to a typical distributed learning, the data in federated learning is very heterogeneous. The reason is in distributed learning, typically you are the data owner, you create the batches and you give it to the machine. So you create those batches, IID. But here, the data is generated at the edge and users have different uh, habits. So the data is heterogeneous. You don't care about a good global model at the end, you wanna make sure the local personalized model at the user is good. So there are personalization aspects. There is also fairness meaning that you don't want the minority to be ignored in the system. So that's creating a lot of interest on the algorithmic design. Another main component, I had a chat with uh, Mandy and Achilles uh, you know, earlier today, with the users own the data, but they don't own the labels. Okay, so typically it is good that they have the data, they don't have the labels. So how would you do unsupervised federated learning? These are again uh, important problems, probably just a little bit work being done on them. On data heterogeneity, there has been a lot of work, but other aspects, there is very little work and much to be done. Then there are a set of problems that arise from a scalability perspective. For example, a typical federated learning assumes that you can do the local training of the large model at the user, but typically, the users won't have even the memory to store the model because you know the models have millions of parameters. So how do you do it over a small edge devices? How do you do federated learning over resource constrained users? From a algorithmic perspective, the convergence in distributed learning at the scale of thousand is understood. We will start pushing it to millions of users very interesting problems arise and even basics are not known there. And finally, another part is a lot of model development is done by over the cloud learning. Once you go to federated learning, what are the right models for the individual users? That's also an interesting problem. And maybe a third research area could be on the trustworthiness. The idea being that once you make a system federated, then alongside of the benefits, a lot of challenges would arise related to trustworthiness, how to ensure the security and resiliency 
perhaps you have adversarial users. And at the same time, there are some advantages. There is growing interest on trusted computing environments. So maybe you can use them to enable trust in such a federated environment. So as you can see, it's a playground for a lot of interesting directions. And as it was mentioned before, we have recently created a research center together with Amazon called USC Amazon Center on Secure and Trusted Machine Learning that is devoted to many of these directions. So for today, I thought I focus on the trustworthiness aspect with a little bit hint on the resource constraint on FL and talk to you about uh, how to focus on how to enable privacy in federated learning, which is really the main motivation for federated learning. So that's, I think, the most important thing to make sure this ecosystem is successful. All right. So just to recap, the promise of federated learning is ensuring privacy by avoiding data movement from the users to the cloud. Since your data stays at your device, then hopefully you are gonna be safe. That was the starting and promising point that got many people interested. Then uh, quickly it was realized that by just keeping the data local, you can't guarantee good privacy. And the reason for it is what is called model inversion attack. Okay, so there are various aspects of, or various versions of this attack. Here is one work that I'm citing here. What these works show that it is possible to invert the local models that are trained at the users and figure out what is a data set that is used for training those models. Okay. So for example, let's say user one trains a model, comes up with a local model X1 of T, gives to the server. What this example shows, it is possible to invert that model and learn the data set. For example, here, this data set was used in training a ResNet 18 or ResNet 152, like a small or large model. The middle one is what has been recovered by inverting the ResNet 18. This one is what has been recovered by inverting a larger model. So you can see as the model becomes larger, maybe inversion becomes difficult, but still you can recover the data set to a very good approximation. Okay, so the point here is by just keeping the data locally, you can preserve privacy. You have to worry about the computations that are leaving the device. From information theoretic perspective, that's not surprising because computations could carry a lot of data and these attacks show it in practice that indeed you can invert them. So that's why as a remedy to this problem in federated learning, secure model aggregation has often been used. And the goal of secure model aggregation is to make sure that the server, for example, Google server, only learns <coughs> the aggregate model across the users, not the individual model. So instead of the users giving the individual model to the server and the server aggregating it, thinking about a mechanism that the server can only learn the aggregate model. So secure aggregation, you can view it essentially as a secure multi-party computing prop where the goal is to just compute the sum and not revealing the individual values. And as you know, in the crypto world, in the CS theory world, there is a lot of work on multi-party computing where several parties come together. Together, they wanna do a computation, so they know the final result, but nobody learns about each individual result. But there are two twists to the problem. One of them is that you don't do the computation one round. There is gonna be several rounds because there is gonna be several rounds of the training. There is a notion of T. Another twist is there is gonna be a large user dropout. And the reason is many users, maybe they wanna participate in federated learning, but maybe they run as slow. They don't have the resources, they get memory full and they can't finish the computation. So they're gonna be delayed. Some of them maybe, you know, you turn off your phone at night, you can't upload the model, you take another phone call. So there are typically a large number of dropouts. And these are the two twists that, you know, makes the problem more challenging. 
nevertheless, uh, you know, there has been a lot of work over the past two, three years on developing secure model aggregation for federated learning. And there has been a lot of interest as of now, many algorithms come up. For example, there was the work by Google who started like the first practical implementation for secure aggregation based on additive sharing. Then about a year and a half ago, we showed that uh, there was a turbo aggregate work that our group did showed you can break the quadratic complexity in secure aggregation. There were follow-up works on reducing the complexity further, for example, by Google again, or by uh, Berkeley folks, uh, Kanan and his group on improving the efficiency. We also have a new paper we posted a couple of days ago that tries to think about secure aggregation from a different perspective, more coding theory perspective. I was originally planning to give a talk on that, uh, but uh, you know, I thought I'd give another one and leave this one for you guys to read. So if you are interested, I remember with some of you guys, I had a discussion on what is the role of coding in uh, federated learning. That's one example that tries to cast secure aggregation problem as a coding theory problem. So if you are interested, take a look at LightSec Act. We posted it a couple of days ago on uh, archive. I would be happy to talk to you on that. From best of my knowledge, this is the fastest, like most efficient in the market and shows the power of coding theory for this problem. Nevertheless, there has also been uh, some works that try to provide hybrid approaches, meaning that not only relying on multi-party computing, perhaps leveraging differential privacy on top of multi-party computing, there is this work by Truex et al that tries to combine both MPC and use MPC for like requiring less noise, DP noise in the system, but they can't handle dropout. You can also view it from encryption perspective. There are these works in the crypto community to solve it from encryption. There is a work, another work that tries to use efficient MPC across non-cluding servers. They become very fast, but they require uh, you know, non-collusion over the cloud, which sometimes is, you know, meaningful, sometimes maybe it's not well motivated. Facebook is also trying to use trusted hardware, like uh, Intel SGX, et cetera, for uh, secure aggregation. And there is a FedBuff work by that group. Nevertheless, you can see, I mean, this is an interesting area, a lot of work in that domain. What I want to talk about for today is not how this literature is moving, but you know, sometimes when I present from Google slides, there is a delay. So that's why I'm pausing. All right. So what I want to do is talk about some privacy concerns that would exist even if you think you are safe because you applied secure aggregation. So it's like some of the issues that secure aggregation by itself can solve, and you have to think about that. I'm gonna discuss some potential solutions to these concerns. And along the way, I mentioned some problems that hopefully you will find interesting. And if you're looking for problems, you can work on them. All right. So let me start by bad news. I mentioned all of these works on secure aggregation. What I want to mention is a weakness that exists in all of them. And the weakness is none of them are secure over multiple runs. What I mean is think about multi-party computing. There is one computation you want to do, and the goal has been how to do that computation securely. And in the MPC literature, no work, I'm not aware of any work that has a sequence of computations that are correlated with each other. So this problem never occurred there. And everybody thought if you make each round secure, overall you should be secure. But in federated learning, the computations at different rounds are very much correlated. Because imagine the local train models, like the, what is train model across different iteration? It won't change much. So there is a lot of correlation. And that correlation can be used to leak privacy. And none of these works 
address it because they just focus on having one strong ground, but not multiple strong ones. So let me show you a maybe toy example to motivate the attack and why you have such privacy leakage. So let's say you have two consecutive rounds of federated learning in the first round or round T, user one, two, three participate and you apply secure aggregation and you learn the aggregate model across users one, two, three. In the next round, round T plus one, maybe user three didn't finish the computation, only user one and two participate and the server applies secure aggregation and learns the aggregate model of user one and two. Now, what you can see is that if you subtract these two, given that the local models typically across two consecutive rounds don't change much, the server can approximate very well the model of the user three. Okay, so it's like, although each round was secure, but because of the correlation across time, you are approximating the model of user three. It's like you learned what user three wanted to tell you while you thought secure aggregation is saving. So this is just a toy example, but to show you how serious it is, let me show you a real uh, scenario. Let's say you have across 40 users, federated learning, you are training MNIST data set with non-IAD distribution. You use random user selection at each round. This is like every federated learning algorithm that I'm aware of does random user selection. In this case, let's say eight users are selected at each round. And what the server would do at each round, you apply secure aggregation means you only learn the aggregate model across those eight users. On top of it, the server tries to combine those aggregate ones and come up with a least square estimator for the individual model of the users. On this plot, I'm reporting the histogram of the reconstruction error for what the server can reconstruct. And note that this is the normalized reconstruction error means how well can the server approximate the model of user i normalized by its size. What you can see is that the normalized reconstruction error is less than five over a thousand for many users. Okay, so five over a thousand means the SNR is so low that you know, the server knows the local model of all these users almost perfectly. And for all the users is below 2% means the amount of estimation noise that the server would have is less than 2% of the size of the data, the magnitude of the data. So very, you know, very high SNR approximation. So what it shows is that although every round you made it secure, but so much was leaked across different rounds. So two questions that yes, I want to ask. Yeah. A quick question here, how much of this is coming from the non-IAD distribution uh, and how much, if, if they were all symmetric in some sense, then it would be a harder problem. It would problem. be worse. So if they were all symmetric, you see- Oh, you mean the models will all be the same, so you learn Exactly. Everything. You see, non-IAD, your hope is that there is more perturbation across time. That's why we put the non-IAD. If it is IID, the model of the users are all going to be the same and much less variation across time. Thank you. I got it. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Awesome. All right. So hopefully it motivates that multi round leakage is serious. Then to think about that, maybe the first question is what is a metric to measure multi round privacy leakage? And once you have a metric, then you can think about how would you design an aggregation protocol that uh, you know, overcomes that leakage? So these are the two questions uh, in order to address this issue. So let me start with the first one, how to measure like multi-round privacy. For that, I need just one notation. And the notation is how to denote the participation of the users, meaning that we noted this is very much depending on how the users are participating in the system. So we need a notation for that. And in order to do that, a formulation of federated averaging with partial user participation would be that at each round, 
I denote the set of users that are participating by a binary row, P at time T, where P at time T is a binary row with ones representing the users who participate, zero for the ones who don't participate. So if your learning has J runs, essentially your aggregation protocol is gonna generate J rows, deciding on what are the set of users who should be participating at that runs. So the problem can be formulated as how should I choose the participation of the users to ensure long-term privacy? Okay, so at least we know what is it that we are looking for. The part that we don't know is what does it mean to ensure long-term privacy? And now I'm gonna put a metric for that. Okay, so keep uh, remembering P for participation of the users. So how should we choose the participation of the users? All right. So now we need a metric for measuring the long-term privacy. To develop that metric, I'm gonna put a, a strong assumption, which is okay, because my metric is just gonna make my metric stronger. I assume that the model of the users don't change across time, meaning that across several runs, the model of user one stays the same. Again, in reality, it would change, but if I assume it's not changing, this would mean my metric is stronger, because even if it's not changing, I wanna ensure that nothing is learned. Okay. So now I can denote the model of the users by a vector X, like X1, X2, Xn. Then what the server is learning is a linear combination of these Xs across different runs. Each row corresponds to participate, participation metrics at that run. For example, in this round, maybe a bunch of them participate. So you learn that row multiplied by the column second row multiplied by the column, et cetera. So these are all the information that is learned by the server. You assume secure aggregation is done at each run. That's why only the server is learning the mixture, not the individual. So now what we want in Word is that, you want to make sure that by learning participation metrics multiplied by the model or all these equations that the server is learning, there is no way to combine them to learn any individual model, or maybe even a stronger, not to learn any aggregate model with less than T users in it. Okay, so the larger the T is like the only thing that the server can learn is aggregate across a larger subset of users. So your notion, your privacy is gonna get stronger. The larger the T, the server is learning less, okay? To formulate that you know, word into math, there are two versions. Linear algebraically, you're imposing a constraint on the row span of these metrics. You wanna make sure in the row span of these metrics, any vector has a certain sparsity limit, meaning that it should not have a sparsity below T. Another way you can say it is that by any combination that the server would do, it should not learn a mixture of the XIs with less than T terms with the same coefficient. Nevertheless, it's just a mathematical representation of what I told you in board, which hopefully is uh, you know, clear. So let me tell you a couple of remarks about this definition. First, an example to clarify it. For example, if you want to have multi-round privacy of T equal to two, what this metric would tell you or guarantee is that the best the server can do is to reconstruct aggregate of two users with the same coefficients. For example, it can only learn xi plus xj for some i and j. If t is equal to three, it can only learn xi plus xj plus xk for some ijk, so on and so forth. And also two other comments. This is like a worst case assumption or a strong assumption. One of them is in this mixture that is learned by the server, we assume all the coefficients are the same. You can weaken it and say you want them to be approximately the same. You shouldn't allow for so much variation because if the coefficient of one user is much stronger than the other one, then you can pretend the other noise is, the other user is noise and approximate the other user. To avoid those issues, we put a strong assumption that the coefficient should be the same 
for the entire group. Another assumption was the model of the users don't change across time. In reality, if they change, even the job of the server is gonna be more difficult. So this metric would say, even if the models don't change, the server can't learn beyond the aggregate model. These could be potential ways to relax the definition and potentially improve the design. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. So now we have a well-formulated the problem. We have a metric for multi-round privacy and we can study that question. How should we choose the participation of the users to guarantee multi-round privacy of T according to the definition that we discussed? Okay, so let me show you some basic so that we get to think about that problem. The simplest baseline is user partition. Okay, so let's say you are partitioning the users to n divided by k groups of size k, n is the total number of users, k is a parameter that you choose. And then you say, I only aggregate one group if the entire group is available and the server never mix and matches across different groups. Okay, so the algorithm of user partitioning is you partition them. The server can aggregate a group if all the users are available in that group, means they have finished the learning, and the server would never choose you know, users from a combination of the groups. Something you can see is that that scheme gives you multi-round privacy, which is equal to the group size. The reason is the server only learns like the summation in that group, the entire sum. There is no cancellation it can do. And there is no mix and match across different groups. Okay, so there is no cancellation. It always learns x1 plus x2 plus xk or xk plus one plus xk plus two x2k, etc. It never learns the subset to help him cancel some users. So the multi-round privacy is gonna be very good, as large as the group size, make the group size large, you can arbitrarily make it large. But there is one issue with this scheme. Can anybody guess? Somebody might drop out and leave. Exactly. So you see, as you make the group size, as Mahdi guessed, as you make the group size large, it is very likely that one user in each group is gonna be dropped. For example, if you have a thousand users here, as long as one of them, only one is dropped, the entire group is useless and can't be chosen by the server. And that can happen often, especially if you go to like 10% dropout, 20% dropout, which are very reasonable numbers, then at least one is gonna be dropped. So what it would mean is in many rounds, no groups are available. Means many rounds of federated learning would go either what it would mean your convergence is gonna be very slow. So that's one baseline. Another baseline is random selection. As I told you before, the privacy of that is very low. What you can mathematically prove is that if you apply random selection and you have a number of rounds equal to the number of users, then with probability approaching one, each individual model can be left. And this is not surprising because think about that participation metrics is guaranteed to become full rank as long as the number of rows is larger than the number of users, okay? Therefore, you can invert it and learn each individual one if you have like a binary, uh, you know, random binary metrics, that's where it's coming from. But on the other hand, the user participation there is good because in any round, any subset of available users can be chosen. So what this shows is that you cannot study multi-round privacy by itself. There is a trade-off and you need a new metric to capture that trade-off. And the metric two is, what is the average of number of users that are participating in the learning? Okay, so we call that average co aggregation cardinality, which is for any scheme, how many users on average can participate in the learning across different rounds? Now with these two metrics, you will have a trade-off between C and T, T being the privacy, 
C being user participation, aggregation cardinality. And the two schemes that I mentioned to you are two endpoints of this trade-off. User partitioning gives you a very good privacy, but terrible participation. Random selection, on the other hand, terrible privacy, but good participation. And the question is, what is this trade-off? How does it look like? What is the optimal scope? I also talk later, this trade-off, you can also view is between privacy and the convergence rate. The idea being that the more users can participate, then if, you know, federated learning is gonna converge faster and I show you how it clearly impacts the convergence rate. I see somebody has raised uh, her hand. Hey, yeah, I wanna ask a quick question. So it seems that the, the, a lot of the challenge comes from the identity that each user has a fixed identity and that the server in pulling them, you know, has access to that identity. What if each round a user basically randomly picks a new ID? Uh, the server do pull uh, a group from a, you know, a subset of the indices from larger set, but doesn't actually know who he's Polling. Very, very good point you are mentioning. Meaning that in the attack that I mentioned to you, I assume it is true that the identity of the users are known. There are also other attacks that they show that you can reveal the identity of the users. Okay, so meaning even if they are choosing random, here you would know based on the you know, similarity that there are attacks that you can figure out who is who. Okay, so meaning first, you would figure out who is who so that you can put your metrics together, then you try to invert it. Okay, thanks. Okay, nevertheless from the, but, but that's a very good question, but that's possible to learn it. And here you want to overcome that too. Salman, I have a related question. Uh, yeah. Are you assuming that the XIs across different rounds um, or, or are, are exercise independent? For example, what happens if I, you know, if, if my, um, you know, Amazon Echo, uh, my friend borrows it and takes it to their home. And at some point in time, what that device is doing becomes correlated with, you know, what my friend's device were doing, was doing in the past. And you know, the assumption that the XIs uh, remain the same um, may not necessarily be the most pessimistic scenario is what I'm and That's true. So that. in the attack that I showed you, mm -hmm. that was a, there was no assumption there, meaning that there was non-IID data and XIs were changing across, like that was a true federated deck. Yeah. Okay. So it means that from attack perspective, even if the models are changing across time, I showed you that the reconstruction error was very you know, low. That's why, you know, that, that's what the attack, the experiment showed is that you cannot rely really on the changing of the model across the iteration to save you. Now, in order to formulate it from a defense perspective, you can put a worst case assumption. It says, even if it's not changing, I'm gonna give you a scheme that you are safe. See, that's why from a defense perspective, it's good to put a worst case assumption. So is the worst case is really uh, if things are not changing or if exactly. things if are, are changing, changing in adversarial manner? Um, no, no, what this one is saying is mm -hmm. uh, the metric that we have, it says even if the models are not changing, there mm -hmm. is no way for the server to learn aggregate with less than T terms in it. Mm -hmm. If they are changing, the job of the server is gonna be more difficult. Good for, for you means you get only a stronger privacy. But here mm -hmm. I wanna make sure even if, everything is a static, there is a privacy that you can guarantee. I see. Okay, thanks. Sure. Great questions. All right. So nevertheless, we have these two points of the trade-off. I mentioned the two metrics. You can make this a little bit more complicated. There is a third dimension that you may care about. I'm not gonna talk much about that, which is on the aggregation fairness meaning that you want many users to participate, but at the same time, you want to make sure they fairly participate. 
meaning that the gap between the average maximum participation and minimum participation is small. This is different from the fairness in like learning perspective. This is fairness from participation perspective. Okay, so in that case, everything would have a third dimension. And what you're looking for is really a scheme that has large privacy, large participation, a small fairness gap. Those are the three things that you care about. Okay, so how can we do that? What I wanna tell you is a proposed approach to get you there. Large privacy, large participation, a small fairness, a small fairness gap. And the idea is combining the concepts from random selection and partition. Meaning that partitioning was giving us a structure to make sure that those equations cannot be combined to marginalize one user. I wanna keep that. But random selection was giving the server flexibility of choosing from a pool of available users, therefore many runs, you could have active users and you could proceed without being idle. Okay, so if you wanna combine them, a natural scheme would be batch partition. And then once you do a batch partition, I'm gonna tell you in a minute what it's gonna be, then there is gonna be a bunch of batches that would be available for the server. The server can choose among the batches, a collection of them or a subset of those batches to combine. And it can put a fairness perspective and do a careful selection of those batches. So what I need to tell you for this scheme is how to do the batch partitioning and the batch selection. Let's start with the batch partitioning. The batch partitioning scheme is gonna have three parameters. N is as usual, the number of users. T is the multi-round privacy you wanna guarantee. And K is the number of users you wanna choose at each round. Okay, so larger the K, this kind of K is gonna be proportional to the user participation. Now the outcome of batch partitioning is gonna be a family of K user sets that you give okay for server to choose them. You say if any of these K user sets are available, you are good to choose them. The batch partitioning is such that you guarantee that as long as the server is choosing among those sets, multi-round privacy T is gonna be guaranteed. Okay, so the first part is coming up with that selection that is okay for the server. We call that by a selection, uh, you know, user group or metrics B. So let me tell you how we design that. Let me first tell you through an example, then you quickly see the generalization. Let's say there are eight users. You want to have multi-round privacy T, and at each round you wanna choose four users and you have to tell the server what is the set of four users that is okay for him to choose. The batch partitioning would say create four batches of size two, okay? So the size of the batch is gonna be the privacy, T equal to two. And then given that you want four users to be chosen, you give okay for the server to choose any of these two batches of the users. So therefore, the set of available users that are okay to be chosen is going to be four choose two rows, which is six sets corresponding to batch one and two, batch one and three, one and four, two, three, two, four, and three, four. In general, batch partitioning would be create batches of size T, allow the server to choose any K divided by T batches among N divided by T. So now you can see there is a no. You want to make sure the T, you know, you control it so that there is gonna be a good number of, because there is a, like a threshold phenomenon. If the T is not exceeding that, several batches are gonna be available. Therefore, the hands of the server is gonna be open to figure out what collection of the batches could be chosen. This, you know, selection metrics, you can also connect it with a, you know, code design. This is an example of a good code design, if you wish, that has a good minimum distance property. Okay, so there are connections to coding theory that you can make for this code design. Unfortunately, those connections, they haven't been formalized yet. The reason is these combinations or the row span, we are gonna look at it over reals while the minimum distance is calculated over finite feet. And that 
doesn't let us to formalize that connection. But my thinking is as long as you choose any set of rows and give okay for the user, for the server to choose them, as long as the minimum distance of it is close to T and the rows are dense, that should be good. But we cannot formalize that. So if you're interested in a coding theory perspective of that, you know, I would be very interested to talk to you if you have ideas on how to bridge this uh, real and finite field gap. Nevertheless, this is the design that we have come up with. And with this design, what you can guarantee is that no matter how you combine the rows, even if you apply nonlinear combination, there is no mixture less than T terms that the server can learn. So this guarantees the multi-round privacy. The next thing that you need to calculate is what is the average user participation that you can have with this scheme. Okay, and to do that, you have to figure out how the users are selected among the batches that are okay. And for that, you apply a simple, uh, you know, load balancing kind of a scheme, meaning that you keep track of what is the frequency that each batch was chosen, and you try to give more weight for selecting batches with, you know, less frequency of being chosen in the past. So that becomes like a minimum frequency selection rule. And once you apply that, let me skip through that. Uh, you can have your theorem for the scheme that I mentioned to you in terms of what privacy it gets, what cardinality and what fairness. The scheme guarantees always multi-round privacy of T that you wish. The fairness gap would be zero. So you can prove by that selection, it would, uh, the, there is no difference between the you know, weakest selection and the strongest selection. And we have a closed form expression for average number of users that can be chosen. Remember, you are selecting K users at a time, so it should be proportional to K. But it is still possible that at some rounds, no K batches are available. That's why it's gonna be a smaller than the K. It's gonna be given by this ugly expression, which is really the probability that no K batches are available across the users. Let me evaluate this for one example. Let's say you have 120 users. You design the multi-round sec ag for parameter k equal to 12, means at each round you select 12 users. The user dropout is 20%. You want to have multi-round privacy of t. Then this design is gonna guarantee the privacy of multi-round privacy of six. And user participation c of t, you plug in this, you get very close to 12, slightly less. Okay, so you are getting a high participation. In general, we can plot this C of T as a function of T, and that would formalize the trade-off that I mentioned to you before. Means that this is the trade-off that the multi-round sec ag would be getting, the trade-off between the privacy guarantee and average user participation. So I'm plotting simply C as a function of T, if you recall, this function depends on P, the user dropout. If the user dropout is very small, you see the trade-off is very good, means that you can keep increasing your privacy guarantee that incurs very little cost on user participation. But as the user dropout increases, the trade-off becomes more substantial. For example, at 50% drop-off, after you go from multi-round privacy of 12, like to six, Sorry, as a, from multi-round privacy of one, you go to six, you keep increasing your T, all of a sudden, very little users can be chosen. So this shows the trade-off. You can further formalize and connect the cardinality, aggregation cardinality to the convergence rate. So that's another theorem that shows how the C impacts your convergence rate. So you can replot this as a trade-off between privacy and convergence rate instead of the C. And what it shows is that perhaps there is a fundamental trade-off that needs to be paid in federated learning. If you want to increase the privacy, that should come at the cost of less user selection and a slower convergence. At this point, you may wonder, this was one design, is this the optimal trade-off? And the answer is yes, if you insist on the restrictive 
assumptions that we put. Means the restrictive assumption is like really the two worst case assumptions that we had a discussion. One of them, the models don't change across time. And the other one, making sure that the coefficients of the aggregate for all the users are the same. If you insist on these two, this trade-off is optimal, means that the scheme that I told you is the best, and there is no hope to improve on the trade-off between privacy and convergence rate. If you relax and say that I don't want the coefficients in each group to be the same, this would make the problem algebraic to say that you only care about the sparsity of the row span or any element in the row span. You don't care what is the size of the elements. Just make sure that there is at least t non-zero elements in any you know, vector in the row span. If you do that, actually there are new designs based on coding that you can come up with to improve on the trade-off. There is also another relaxation. Maybe you rely on the user models changing across time to further improve. But nevertheless, if you insist on those worst case assumptions, that's the optimal scheme. So to wrap up this part, let me go back to the experiment that I showed you. Applying secure aggregation across multi-round, all the individual models are gonna be learned by the server. Now we have a new scheme, the multi-round sec act. Let's say for the same experiment, you apply it. So here is the result that you would get. The same thing, the only thing that changed, you did the user selection according to multi-round seg act. And again, I'm plotting the reconstruction error of how well the server can estimate the local model of the users. And here is the histogram. Sorry. All right, so now what you can see is that there is a huge difference. The reconstruction error, the normalized reconstruction error, now for all the users is larger than a quarter. Quarter is a very good number, meaning that the amount of noise in the estimation is proportional to the signal. Like SNR, you know, that's as good as you can expect. And for many users, even the amount of noise is larger than the signal itself. So it means there is nothing by combining the server is hurting and there is you know, no good estimate that it can come up with. So you can see there is a two order of magnitude in terms of reconstruction error that you can save. There are many more experiments uh, that we have in the paper. For example, if you wanna look at larger models, larger data sets, for example, here is for SciFAR 10, architecture is Linux, more users instead of 40, 120 users, and you wanna do 12 users selecting it across different rounds. And let's say the dropout probability is also heterogeneous, meaning some users have 10% dropout, some users 20%, etc. You can look at the three metrics, privacy, user participation, and fairness gap. And the benchmarks are random selection, partitioning, and the multi-round seg ag that I mentioned to you. These experiments would verify what we theoretically discussed. For example, from privacy perspective, random selection at the beginning has good privacy. After several runs, proportional to number of users, all of a sudden, the privacy drops to one. While multi-round sec ag, it goes to the privacy guarantee that you design it for. For example, you design it for T equal to six, it stays there and never goes below. From aggregation cardinality, of course, random selection is very good. Here, all the 12 users, you can choose them across time. Random or a scheme, you know, it's not that bad if you insist on eight users, you know, like k equal to eight, around the eight users can be chosen. So there is not much deviation, while user partitioning is very bad. And from fairness, you can see that random selection, for example, doesn't go to zero. You can make it weighted random selection, it would go to zero. The same thing, multi-round seg ag is also going to zero. So essentially this scheme gets you to the point that I motivated at the beginning. Large privacy, large user participation or fast conversions and zero fairness gap. 
There are also more experiments, IID distribution versus non-IID distribution, okay? And you can show, I mean, here we are looking at, uh, for example, the test accuracy. So this shows the impact on the convergence because if not enough users are participating, you may have a penalty on convergence and the test accuracy. We are showing in both IID data distribution and non-IID for CIFAR 10, our scheme is as good as random selection. Okay, so what it would mean, there is no penalty that you have to pay in terms of this uh, partition selection of the users. While if you do the partitioning the scheme, actually there is a big gap. And that's the reason because many rounds, users cannot be chosen and you don't converge or you converge perhaps very slowly and you don't see it here. So let me uh, summarize so far. I had two other directions that time permitting I can talk about, but I can summarize uh, you know, the main part of the talk. We talked about random user selection in FL and that can lead to serious privacy leakage. multi round SecAg is the first scheme to mitigate this challenge. And I think it reveals an interesting trade-off between privacy and convergence rate. There are some immediate directions as we mentioned, relaxation of the setting and thinking about better designs is very promising. We are seeing it in some perspective. So if you are interested, I think, especially not insisting on the coefficients being the same, that can be one way. Another direction is formalizing the trade-off between privacy and convergence rate in FL. The third direction is a little bit broader, meaning that here we want to make sure the server only learns aggregate of the model of some users. But you need one step further in guaranteeing that the aggregate of T users is not leaking about model of one user. Okay, so here there is a leap of faith in federated learning. You're assuming that kind of other users are like behaving like noise and masking each other. That to some extent is true, but requires some distribution assumption. In general, formalizing that to say how much aggregate model is privacy preserving, I think is a very important direction. If there are questions here, I can stop. Otherwise, you know, there are two directions that I can also mention briefly. Salman, I had a quick question here. I mean, this is more just trying to formalize the problem in some sense you're you're looking at like a semi-static thing right so i have right now i have some data with me um and then i i basically am training for a while with uh, and there's some dropouts or whatnot and you want to see how well you can predict it uh, but there could be another viewpoint where it's basically my data is some random process in some sense generated through um some model and um and then I would, in that setting, I would be more interested in things like um, maybe some sort of rate distortion type uh, type questions for privacy as opposed to uh, the kind of privacy that you're talking about. I mean, how would you, I mean, is there a viewpoint to consider this latter sense or should we just stick to this more um, every round in the semi-static way or basically to ensure everything works out fine? No, this is a very good question. You see, maybe I tell you the reason we looked at the static version. I mean, one reason is, of course, this is worst case, meaning that it's good for privacy studies. So meaning that even if in the static case, you cannot learn in the dynamic case, it would be even more difficult. And that's typically the guarantee you wanna give, right? So that's why it's okay from the, you know, security assumption, you put, you know, worst case assumption. But maybe what you are saying is that ties your design and maybe you can do even better by relying on the temporal aspects. One reason which makes it difficult is formalizing correlation across time. Meaning that it is true that the models are changing across time. But if you want to leverage that, you need to have a, like a model that captures it, right? If you want to come up with a metric and formalize that, the question is, could you come up with a model that captures the temporal aspect of federated learning, how your data distribution changes across time, how your model changes. These are very difficult to do. So we couldn't do it mathematically, right? You can empirically maybe leverage that 
but I'm sure by using that, you know, temporal changes, you can even further improve privacy, which I think you can, and that's possible to do. But what to formally guarantee, I don't know, as opposed to empirically guarantee. You know what I mean? Yes, thank you. The question you. is, are you shooting for empirical improvement on privacy or theoretical guarantees on the privacy? Not true, I agree. I mean, I was thinking more in the sense of maybe there is some sort of, uh, I don't know, RMAR type model for the how the data changes and can you, depending on when you when the system, can you actually construct the model and the data beyond that and knowing a few points? So I don't know, I'm just thinking a little That's bit. That's right. So you see, one way you can go one step further, maybe without complicating it, let's say these XIs, you put a, you know, change across time and, what you are saying is exactly the noise in the reconstruction. So remember when I said the server is going to combine those rows, right? There was no noise because everything was a static. Yeah. So here there is going to be remaining noise for each estimator. So your rate distortion is really the noise power, like your estimation noise versus the cardinality of the users that you are choosing. So that's going to be your fourth dimension. Sure. No, thank you. Yeah, maybe in the interest of time, you could just quickly uh, go through the other things that you were mentioning, because you want, you had a lot of interesting research directions in mind. So maybe it's good for the sure, students. Yeah, maybe I, I mentioned two directions. So far, everything, the assumption was that you have an honest but curious, meaning that all the users participate and the server just wants to learn it securely across them. The challenge is that there is gonna be, you know, bad users. They don't need to be adversarially bad. I mean, just imagine if the training is done locally, one user may just have garbage data or the bug in the training or something. There is gonna be faulty users. And the problem is, you know, if you have adversarial users, again, faulty, bad, and that's real, means that the bad and faulty happens today too. How do you know? I mean, there are millions and maybe one round of the training, the user is gonna, you know, run, have a bug in the code. So the question is, how would you detect a bad model without seeing the individual model? Okay, so that come a little bit opposite direction. In the work on adversarial, adversarial learning, you assume that you see the locally trained model of the users and you try to distinguish bad ones. Here, once you wanna put the privacy and apply secure aggregation, you wanna make sure the local models, the server can see it. Okay, so that becomes a very interesting problem. How to detect bad models if you cannot see them? How can you do it? And I think that in general, opens up uh, in many interesting directions in order to approach that. Uh, for example, you know, there are two ways of detecting bad models, and then you can think about how would I detect them while preserving privacy. One of them is a distance-based outlier detection, meaning that you would say a bad model is the one that is further away from the rest of the models. That's something that we have done. There is a paper that we had which shows distance-based outlier detection, you can do it, while preserving the privacy of local model. And the idea is do the distance calculation again via MPC. Means not only apply MPC for aggregation, but apply MPC for the distance calculation. This is one work that shows it is possible, but there are many issues. For example, the complexity of these schemes grows again quadratically with the number of users. So how to break that is going to be an issue. The other one is distance-based methods are not the best way to detect bad models. The reason is that they can distinguish between bad model and rare model or bad data and rare data because they just say you are away from the others. So you can be away for good reasons because you are the only one who has the rare data that is needed for learning or for bad reasons because you are doing something adversarial and you cannot capture it. That's why there is interest more on the Another type of outlier detection, which is performance-based outlier detection, that you try to judge each user based on the performance of the model that it gives you. And that line of work, there is a lot of work on performance-based outlier detection, again, without privacy protection. 
meaning that there are these users, you see the local model, how do you know which one of them is a bad one or malicious? There are various methods, median, Boolean, etc. We have done some very recent work on how to enable the same thing, means both performance-based detection as well as guaranteeing the privacy. Nevertheless, I think that area is pretty much open, a lot of work that needs to be done in that domain. Okay, so I leave that. You can take a look at the paper. My final you know, topic is thinking about aggregation beyond the average. Here, I assume that all of the users are training the same model and the role of the server is to average that. Federated learning has started from that, but you can quickly imagine there is a lot of resource constraint at the users and the users can't train large models. So in reality, you know, you need a different paradigm for the aggregation. Okay, so meaning there are two paradigms currently we discuss either transfer the data, train a large model at the cloud, or keep the data and transfer the model. That's federated learning versus centralized training. What uh, our high level idea is and what we champion for is maybe federated learning should be viewed more as a knowledge transfer meaning that there is something that each user is going to learn perhaps over a, a small model. And the goal of federated learning is to transfer that knowledge to a bigger model. Okay, so how would you do that? We have done some work in that area, at least to formulate federated learning as a federated group knowledge transfer. That's a paper we had last year at NUIPS. It formulates federated learning as knowledge transfer from a smaller models to larger model. So it shows, like the, essentially you can view this as combining the advantages of split learning and federated learning. So you get the best of both sides. But nevertheless, once you put that angle and view federated learning as knowledge transfer, I think the maybe broader question is, how would you pr protect privacy leakage when you are transferring knowledge from a smaller models to a big model. And that's something that is not at all explored. I don't know any work in that domain. And I think that's the end of my talk. Hopefully, you know, I motivate that the privacy in federated learning should not be taken for granted. There are many interesting problems, starting from multi-round leakage to adversarial setting to formal privacy guarantees to even thinking broadly how to ensure privacy in knowledge transfer in federated learning. So let me stop here. Maybe I can take more questions. Time for me. Yeah, thanks, Arman. So uh, I'll leave the floor open for people to ask questions. And then I may ask one or, or a comment afterwards. Yeah, please unmute yourself and ask a question if you have it. Uh, yeah, I had a, a question about kind of, you know, you, you talked about kind of, you know, all of the models or all of the kind of different devices kind of trying to train a, a particular model. Um, but I guess kind of one thing I'm curious about is kind of, you know, like someone brought up, you know, they, they move their Alexa to a different home or something like that. Um, I guess kind of what when the populations that the the different devices are starting to diverge too much, I guess kind of how do you handle that? Do you still try to put it all in the same model or do you start dealing with different subpopulations? Very good question. You know, that's related to a large body of work. I would say that is like the first algorithmic challenge in federated learning, which is the data heterogeneity means even can you guarantee convergence if the population is too diverse? You can imagine if it is very diverse, right? there is no good global model that you can learn. So those things I would say to some extent are well understood. First, you have to define the notion of diversity. One way is, you know, typical ways that you formulate it is what is the gap between like the local you know, optimizers versus the global optimizer. You don't want it to be that different. And as a function of that, you can prove convergence. In reality, what would be the, you know, 
biggest issue is that because of that diversity in the distribution, like heterogeneous distribution, there is a performance gap in federated learning. Meaning that not that you don't converge, you converge, but your performance is gonna be below what you would converge over the centralized training. Okay, so that's why there is a lot of work on how to bridge that gap. Typical yeah. ways, you know, there are various angles that people would take to do it. If you're talking about coming up with different model, something, uh, you know, uh, that we have discussed, there are other groups working on it too, is maybe trying to adapt the model to the distribution, as opposed to just do the algorithmic matching of the distribution. But that uh, direction in general is a, you know, good direction in the sense of how much would you hurt because of the data distribution? And how should you choose the users from that angle? Thank you. Um, do you, you said it was kind of well, a well understood problem. Do you have any kind of suggestions about, you know, papers to read kind of regarding yeah. that? Or, so the, maybe I should be careful about the claim that I mentioned. Well understood in the sense that under assumptions on the heterogeneity, you can prove convergence, okay? So meaning that you know where you are converging and you can guarantee that. So uh, maybe my suggestion is like search for non-IID federated learning convergence guarantees that gives you where theoretically is well understood. What is not understood is the gap between IID and non-IID in terms of the performance gap, okay? So meaning because of the non-IID distribution, there is an accuracy gap that you are paying and that accuracy gap is actually very large. For example, order of 10% accuracy now compared to the centralized. Okay, so the comparison is federated learning versus centralized. How much of a gap would you have? And that part is not understood, like how much of it is fundamental? Maybe there is a gap that you have to pay. There is no improvement or maybe algorithmic. Still, there is a lot of algorithmic, like algorithms coming up to bridge that gap. So that's the part that is not understood. The part that is understood is from optimization perspective, would you converge under what assumptions you come to converge? Got it, thank you. Sure. So Salman, I had um, sort of a, um, a broader question here. I mean, in the sense, what is the goal of federated learning? Is it, um, I mean, I, I, was, look, let's look, I was thinking of it more formally, instead of just looking at the objective being the average or anything, should you think of it as finding the common information of, between all the users? Is that what you should aim for? Think of it formally in a way? And in that case, um, maybe it's not the, average it's some other function some combination which is the actual common information and that's what you, the the global model should pick up excellent question so so let's put the maybe optimization angle then you can get there so remember at the end of the day your goal is to minimize a loss over the data set that is scattered mm -hmm. correct so now that's really your objective. Like what is the model that minimizes that loss? So you can formulate it that way. The issue with that is at each round, you are getting the answer to a sub problem. The answer being that every user is trying to minimize the loss over its local data set. Is that over a, a specific distribution of the data set, it tells you this is the model that minimizes my loss, okay? So now the question is, how do you combine the answer to those sub optimization problems to solve the bigger optimization problem? Does that make sense? Sure. So you can yeah. formulate that. That's something that, you know, we thought a little bit, we didn't pursue it, but I think there are, toy optimization version of the problem that you can formulate that has captured that. But essentially, I think that that angle could be good in the sense of you are finding suboptimal solutions to an optimization problem, or maybe not suboptimal, sub-problem optimization, maybe over less number of variables, that would be a smaller models or different distribution. 
and you try to find the optimal for a unknown global distribution. That's how I would formulate it. So I, I was thinking of it a little bit more broadly as in as thinking of each user having a some, I mean, let's take it, let's take it as one data set. And so it's a, style, it's a static problem that you're looking at. So there is some joint distribution across all the users. And in some ways I want to, each has a realization from that, uh, from that distribution. And uh, you want to figure out what is the sort of the common information in some sense, some sense crystallizing what is joint between these. And that's what the global server would, I mean, it, so I was looking at it more from an information theoretic. Yes, that type no, I understand that idea. So you want to focus on one round only and say there is X1 through XK. What is the yeah. function of X1 through XK, which is more representative of each XIs? Yeah. That you can do. I think that's a very good angle. You have to put some restrictions on how you are going to get it. But the question is, is it anything better than the average, more representative of the XIs? I don't know the answer to that. And I think so it'll depend on the distribution, average. right? I mean, yeah, it will depend on the distribution. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a very good angle. Mm -hmm. It's like a one shot, clean, and then you can empirically see if you change the aggregator to maybe, you can also say you apply the mutual information angle, right? Sure. So it means that your metric is that f of x1 through xk or the output of the aggregator should maximize the mutual information to individual XIs. Yeah. And plus, in some sense, you want to capture privacy through some means that you cannot directly predict what those things are in some sense. Right? That's so right. You have to preserve something there as well. Very good. Yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah. I like that. You should do it. Any other questions um, from anyone? So if if not, let me uh, let us thank uh, Salman for an excellent talk. So Salman has got a few slots tomorrow to meet with anyone. So if you are anyone's interested, please email Kate Goodwin. She may be able to put you in on the schedule. Anyway, we'll talk tomorrow. Salman. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks for the great. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.